What is the beginning of Christianity? Or perhaps we could put the question a little bit differently, a little bit more clearly. What is the beginning of Christianity with respect to the experience of an individual's conversion? We could, depending on our theological persuasion, probably come up with a few defensible answers to this question. But today we're going to look at what the answer, what answer J. Gresham Machen uh, gave in his writings. And he said it was the consciousness of sin. So who was J. Gresham Machen? Uh, he was a respected conservative New Testament scholar and Presbyterian. He was active during the 1920s and 30s during the height of the fundamentalist modernist controversy in which the, uh, these factions argued over the inerrancy of scripture and the existence of the supernatural, among other things. Uh, he founded the Westminster Theological Seminary in 1929. He founded the Orthodox Presbyterian Church in 1936. Uh, as conservatives, as people who believed in historic Christian doctrines, uh, were increasingly marginalized in the mainline church. So uh, he also wrote a number of ex excellent books, uh, one of which is, is very well known, Christianity and Liberalism. Uh, but among other books, he also wrote a number of shorter writings. And today, uh, as we look through, as we look at this uh, concept of the consciousness of sin, we're going to see how pervasive it is in his writings. He clearly thought uh, that this doctrine was truly uh, a, a foundation, a key foundation uh, for, for Christianity. So let's start then with a definition. What is the consciousness of sin, at least to Machen? Um, we can start by saying what it's not. It's not just uh, an awareness that there is sin in the world, that sin is out there. Uh, it's not even uh, a mere intellectual acceptance that I uh, am uh, a sinner, that I have sin in my life. Uh, but rather, it's, it's three things, he says. It's first a conviction of the whole mind and heart. Second, it's a profound understanding of one's own lost condition. And third, it's an illumination of the deadened conscience. So let's see, first of all, why Machen considered the, the consciousness of sin to be the foundation or prerequisite for faith. And so he says in Christianity and Liberalism, without the consciousness of sin, the whole of the gospel will seem to be an idle tale. So let's first look, one of the, the main reasons he gives uh, for why consciousness of, consciousness of sin is, 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 a, is a foundation for faith is that it's necessary for accepting God's wrath and punishment. Uh, in Machen's day, like today, the doctrines of God's wrath, the punishment of hell, uh, not very popular. Uh, liberals, those who uh, were rejecting historic Christianity, uh, speak with horror of the doctrine of an alienated or an angry God, Machen writes. So, of course, under this view, man and God aren't really that separate. Uh, any sin that may exist doesn't put a gulf between us. Uh, God should just let bygones be bygones. Um, it's, and this is much more pleasant than the alternative, right? We, we don't like to believe in a doctrine of hell. Uh, and maybe it is more pleasant, perhaps, but it's only possible to believe this if we ignore or explain away the clear teachings of Jesus, such as in Matthew 10, 28, uh, and particularly if we have no experience of our own sin. As Machen writes, modern men have lost the sense of guilt and the fear of hell. But the early Christians, whether Jews or Gentiles, had not. They accepted Christ as Savior only because he could rescue them from the abyss and bring them into right relation to the ruler and judge of all the earth. The second reason that we might consider or that Machen argued uh, for the consciousness of sin being the foundation or a foundation for, for faith uh, is that it's necessary for believing in the supernatural. Now, miracles and the supernatural are admittedly hard to accept. Uh, our default inclination is generally to disbelieve stories that we hear about supernatural occurrences, which means we might naturally reject the idea of a God-man born of a virgin. Uh, we might reject miracles. We might reject the resurrection. 
In college, I tried to explain to an atheist friend uh, various proofs of the resurrection, like the un unlikelihood of the apostles stealing Christ's body and then maintaining that lie to their gruesome deaths, or the impossibility of Jesus surviving the crucifixion and then resuscitating, uh, regaining consciousness back uh, in, the, in the tomb. Um, but to my atheist friend, these kinds of proofs, these kinds of explanations didn't matter. To him, nothing was more implausible than a man rising from the dead. So why would he, why would we accept the supernatural, the resurrection, the miracles? Uh, first of all, we might, we might uh, accept that because we realize how desperately we need the supernatural. Machen writes, the truly penitent man rejoices in the supernatural, for he knows that nothing natural can possibly meet his need. And we can recognize this need only when we have true consciousness of sin. A merely human Jesus, a mere sage of Nazareth, has no power to save me from my predicament. And Machen continues, the sage of Nazareth may satisfy those who have never faced the problem of evil in their own lives. But to talk about an ideal to those who are under the thraldom of sin is a cruel mockery. Yet if Jesus was merely a man like the rest of men, then an ideal is all we have in him. Far more is needed by a sinful world. But even if I admit that I have a need for a supernatural savior, how can I rationally believe in one? And so our third point here in this section is that this is necessary. The consciousness of sin is necessary for intellectual assent to Christianity. And that, to Machen, is a key aspect of faith. It re faith requires intellectual assent. How can I assent to something that it seems so anti-scientific uh, as, the, as the supernatural? Machen takes that question and turns it around. He contends that consciousness of sin is a fact that the truly rational man will take into account as he evaluates the claims of Christianity. So let's start with, with one quote here. If you take account of all the facts, you will be convinced of the truth of Christianity. But you cannot take account of all the facts if you ignore the fact of sin. You cannot take account of all the facts if, while searching the heavens above and the earth beneath, you neglect the facts of your own soul. He puts it another way a little bit later uh, in What is Faith? He says, in order to come to the Christian view of Christ, it is necessary only to be scientific. But no one can be truly scientific who ignores the fact of sin. So we'll leave that uh, We'll leave it at that for that particular section, but now we'll move on to, to ask, what are the effects of the absence of the consciousness of sin? Uh, what, is, what happens if we lack consciousness of sin in our lives? A few different things we can mention here that, that, that Machen brings up in his writings. First of all, we might say that repentance is cheap. Uh, I can just ignore my sins uh, or explain them away as trivial, even if they have devastating effects on others. The second thing that I might lack or that I'd be prone to uh, in this case would be legalism. If I lack consciousness of sin, I'll be more likely to be legalistic. And that se might seem ironic, right? Uh, but actually it's not. If I don't have consciousness of sin, I'm inclined to think that my own efforts will suffice to erase my mistakes, my peccadillos, whatever we want to call them. Uh, I don't have any need for radical grace in my life. And Machen, as Machen writes, so it always is, a low view of law always brings legalism in religion. A high view of law makes a man a seeker after grace. Third effect of the absence of consciousness of sin will is what we might call the social gospel. Uh, I'll prefer the social gospel in that scenario. Uh, if the only real hell, if there is no actual supernatural hell, uh, the only hell that exists is hell on earth, the church's mission then becomes worldly, not spiritual. Social transformation, the meeting of physical needs take precedence over the saving of souls. And then fourth, uh, fourth effect of the absence of the consciousness of sin would be social collapse or societal collapse. 
disregard for human law naturally follows from a disregard for God's law. As Machen writes, what sort of age is this in which the law of God is regarded as obsolete and in which there is no consciousness of sin? I will tell you, it is an age in which the disintegration of society is proceeding on a gigantic scale. Look about you and what do you see? Everywhere, the throwing off of restraint, the abandonment of standards, the return to barbarism. Uh, he wrote that in 1936. So how do we respond to what we've learned uh, from Machen today? How do we inspire in others a consciousness of their own sin? Uh, first, we need to proclaim the law, uh, preach the gospel with the goal of convicting people of their sin. Um, but it's not enough to just pass that job off to the preachers uh, and to others that have a, a voice in society, perhaps. Uh, verbal proclamation is not enough, as Machen writes. But if the consciousness of sin is to be produced, the law of God must be proclaimed in the lives of Christian people as well as in word. It is quite useless for the preacher to breathe out fire and brimstone from the pulpit if at the same time the occupants of the pews go on taking sin very lightly and being content with the moral standards of the world. The rank and file of the church must do their part in so proclaiming the law of God by their lives that the secrets of men's hearts shall be revealed. But even that, the proclaiming of the law by word and by deed, uh, is not sufficient. Ultimately, our efforts themselves are, are not going to bring about the consciousness of sin. The Spirit of God, Machen writes, is the ultimate source of the consciousness of sin, as he writes. Is it not utterly hopeless to try to get the people of the 20th century to take the law of God with any seriousness or to be the slightest bit frightened about their sins? I answer, certainly it is hopeless, absolutely hopeless, as hopeless as it is for a camel to try to pass through the eye of a needle. But you see, there is one who can do hopeless things, that is, the Spirit of the living God. Do not fear, you Christians. The Spirit of God has not lost his power. In his own good time, he will send his messengers even to a wicked and adulterous and careless generation. He will cause Mount Sinai to overhang and shoot forth flames. He will convict men of sin. He will break down men's pride. He will melt their stony hearts. Then he will lead them to the Savior of their souls. So we'll stop there uh, for today. Uh, thanks so much for watching this short video. I hope it was helpful. I hope to produce additional content about J. Gresson Machen and Reformed Theology in general. So if you're interested in this kind of thing, uh, feel free to uh, subscribe to this channel. Uh, thanks for watching.